Now, this is the most informal I've ever presented, uh, and I was inspired by Dr. Anderson's reference to nice smelling uh, and medicinally. number of uses for bamboo, but there's many different species of bamboo. And of course, coconut plant is another one that is these multi-purpose plants. That's really how I got interested in this long ago, under the influence of University of California geographer named Carl Sauer, Edgar Anderson, Jack Carlin, and several others, including uh, Nikolai Babilov. So we have medicinal uh, uses, as uh, O'Shaughnessy's picture there. He was working in India in the uh, first half of the 19th century. And then, of course, there's fiber uses, cordage, extremely important uh, throughout history, and everything from uh, sailing vessels to clothing to ropes, and I would say all the way back to the Pleistocene in catching animals and in fishing, which settles us down, and it's the Mesolithic period, if that still is appropriate to the crossover from Paleolithic to Neolithic in this transitional and a great leap forward of humans towards ecological dominance, uh, nets played a very important role, and women's role in this is very important as well, in catching small animals and eventually fish, as we'll uh, be talking about later at the uh, economic botany meetings about a month, I want to talk about fishing and hemp, and also the connection with horses, humans, and hemp in history. So seed use is very important right up to the modern day, and most people today think of it as a mind-altering substance. Uh, in the past, this mind-altering substance wasn't as much recreational, I would argue, as purification, funeral rites, like so many of the so-called plants of the gods that Dr. Schultes Albert Hoffman and others, like Weston LeBaire, have argued is a pan-world uh, uh, phenomena coming out of Africa and finding our floras and discovering those plants that we could eat, those that could stun fish, those that could be used for fiber and other materials, uh, also those that could transport us to communicate with our ancestors. So these maps are stretched out, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the, well, our hypothesis is in the Pleistocene, uh, two re major refugia, we're going to argue, that develop two different species of cannabis. It's been a long-term lumping or splitting issue within the genus cannabis. Uh, one 
species or three species or more. We argue <clears throat> that over here in the eastern Himalayan region up here in this plateau and mountainous region here uh, was one of the main refuge, uh, refugia. And from this develops the plant that has the allele that produces a THCA, which can be converted when heated up to a certain degree to THC, which is the active ingredient. Uh, another refugia was in the Caucasus Mountain, and now we're going to take you over here to show you this region we think was the, the refugia from which developed the other species, cannabis sativa we'll call it. We have these acronyms to point out narrow-leafed hemp versus narrow-leafed drug plants and broad-leafed drug plants. For those of you who know something about the typology, uh, these will make sense and uh, uh, we've discussed this a lot in our, our text that will be coming out. <clears throat> here is just a few selected <clears throat> sites to show you more recent uh, colonization human dispersal, probably in most cases, of the plant. The other only species in the family Cannabaceae is Humulus. That, of course, is uh, three or four species. Uh, and Humulus lupus, lupulus is famous for uh, beer additive for bitters. Uh, that's a vine. And it also, like cannabis, likes open, exposed environments which humans uh, are adapted to. And in that Mesolithic period, after the Pleistocene, perhaps before, during the Pleistocene, uh, when humans moved in 3,500 years, 35,000 years ago, probably in that uh, time frame during interglacial periods or warming periods along streams where they could uh, find cannabis and come in close contact with it, certainly by the Holocene. And these are some selected sites in different ages of pollen, seed, fiber, paper, and ca even cannabinoids, which are suggested to have been found in a few places. Uh, all of these are suspect uh, some are, have a higher degree of certainty than others, especially the macro fossil finds. Pollen is difficult to discern between humulus and cannabis. Here is the site I want to talk about uh, uh, and we'll refer to perhaps a little later. It's not that far from Tokyo and uh, engineers uh, excavating an area where there was a landslide found potsherds, fragments of pots with cannabis seeds really attached to them, 10,000 years old. This is in the early Joman, which means the Joman people. That means corded pottery. And uh, these uh, people who first moved out into what's now the J uh, Japan archipelago, uh, perhaps in two land bridge regions, uh, brought with them some plants and probably were cultivating them, certainly managing them, as Gary Crawford, leading archaeologist and other uh, Japanese archaeologists have recognized with the finds of fossil seeds in Hokkaido down here uh, in Honshu and in this most recent one that's dated roughly 10,000 years ago. But that means not that it's original area here, that it was in Korea, has ancient history in China and probably from Central Asia. Its natural adaptation is the continental uh, environment. For example, where does it grow naturally and uh, colonized in North America, where it was only introduced some hundreds of years ago. In places like Kentucky and in Illinois, along channels and streams, it's a uh, quick grower in the springtime. This annual plant grows in the short, hot summer, and then the seeds are covered in snow or are uh, able to survive the cold winter and go through its life cycle again. Uh, so humans probably discovered it in Central Asia and moved it all the way across over here very early on, if not before, certainly by the early Holocene. Now, uh, selected sites in uh, Europe. We'll get back to this and you can read all about it uh, if you wish in the future. Uh, this from about here on is almost all for a non-psychoactive use. Because the species that was native here does not have the allele, the BT allele, that produces this. So very low amounts of the psychoactive substance. That seems to have evolved in the uh, eastern uh, refugia that I mentioned before. And we have uh, documented all kinds of different places where it's known to grow and trying to sort out whether it's truly wild or feral, which has been interpreted as wild. Then obviously the cultivated varieties have lots of uh, selection, artificial selection, and then the feral varieties. And so we discuss in our book the ethno, uh, I'm sorry, the evolutionary biology and, and of course the ethnobotanical history. So you can see there's lots of different reports over time, over the last 
say, 10,000 years, in especially in an exponential increase in the last 10 to 20 years with the rise of archaeobotanical science, first in Europe and now spreading into China, were remarkable finds, which I'll briefly touch on in the past. So I want to jump forward to about 2,300 years ago, let's say in the first millennium uh, uh, BCE, if you will, and across the European steppes, all the way from the Scythians here, all the way over here to the Joman, who are just about to be overrun, so to speak, or integrated with the Yayoi people. These are the rice, the introduction of rice may have come a little before the Yayoi people, but not much before 2300 years ago. And at that time, up to about, well, 2,000 to 4,000 years ago, cannabis was one of the five main grains of China until it got substituted by sesame or some other crops and it dropped off. It's still a snack food and it's been selected for large seeds over time. So I want to take us to the Scythian period and point out, most of you that are any familiar at all, and I know you're not interested or have anything to do with cannabis, but you may have read somewhere, <laughs> got to laugh out of that, that the father of history, Herodotus, referred to in his book four that the barbarians, of course they weren't civilized like the Greeks, barbarian Scythians were always uh, supposed to be nomadic. They were farmers who were different, some more nomadic, some more settled down. North of them had a lot of things that made them barbarians. One was when their great leader, their chief, died and some of his in a uh, group that were so loyal to him, which was a characteristic of the Central Asian steppe empires that Dr. Anderson referred to, and you can read quite a bit about it from Christopher Beckwith and others uh, about uh, great empires of the Silk Road. But by this time you had uh, these tribal groups, if you will, or chiefdom level groups that, and some would even argue, empires. Now the Scythians were reported by Herodotus to go into their uh, tent-like structure something he referred to, and uh, covered over with some, uh, say, felted material, and in a metal sensor. Does this remind you of early Chinese uh, metal implements that you'll see in the first sections of any museum that features ancient Chinese archaeological uh, materials, etc., cultural history? In the charcoal, they would burn cannabis, according to Herodotus, and go into their tents and breathe the vapor baths. And he made a kind of allusion that this is the only kind of bath they'd take. And then they'd howl in their vapor baths. Well, these are, you know, perspectives of one culture on the other. The amazing thing is, 2,500 years ago, later, Rodenko in the, in a, in the first half of the uh, 20th century, uh, excavating in near the Chinese border in Russia, Kurgans or these uh, mounds for burial mounds that celebrated these great chiefs who were buried with their horses, buried with their main soldiers, their wives uh, and slaves, etc. in these ritualistic burials. They uncovered these implements, it's very similar to what Herodotus has said. And not only that on the censors he referred to, but the seeds of cannabis. Some have thought that they were burning the seeds in order to, like coriander, a nice flavor, because when people are dying, there are uh, odors that are not that pleasant. So maybe it was, this was the purification uh, aspect of it, really an, uh, uh, for a better odor, uh, deodorizer, essentially. However, others argue that uh, you put the inflorescence on there, that couldn't be seeded, but if it's female and it comes from this uh, cannabis indica, which has the allele for the BT uh, production of tetrahydrocannabinol, you would uh, throw the inflorescence on there and the flowers and the uh, bracts which have many of these uh, trichomes on them to secrete the resin would be inhaled and it would purify and there would be a communication, a way of sending the chief on to the afterworld is one interpretation. So I want to take you beyond that over to a recent find in the 21st century uh, to Western Jiang, uh, Xinjiang, and that's over here in Turpan, uh, where the peoples that are native there, I think you pronounce it Uyghur, in any case, they still smoke uh, hashish and cannabis. Uh, some would argue, well, that's just a recent last few hundred years. No, it probably goes way, way back. And that's one of the main differences between the Chinese who have been migrating in and uh, colonizing the area. That's the modern history. Uh, they found in 1990 a whole series of tombs, uh, the Yanghai uh, tombs near Tirpan. And this is a desert area. And uh, 
in this series of tombs, they discovered one of these tombs. Now, these are about 30 feet down, means it's the same temperature year round, like a refrigerator, uh, and therefore highly preservative for materials. One of the more amazing uh, ethnobotanical macro or uh, archaeobotanical finds in recent history. And about 2,700 year old, these included the remains of many female psychoactive cannabis flowers, seeds, leaves, and stems. And so moving on, given the amount of time I have here, this is a mass, one of the masses that came out of a preparation bowl. And actually, this one, another mass was in this, which was placed next to the, the male figure there, and another bowl, which was probably used to, as a, like mortar and pestle, to prepare medicinal potions or other things. And it wore out, and they used that to put in there. And the amount that was brought out are remarkably preserved. First time we've ever seen anything like this from any other plants included, let alone cannabis, almost uh, two pounds worth of it. And this was later, uh, the person who was in charge from Beijing University, a PhD candidate at the time, uh, Jiang Honen, wrote to me and uh, sent me a paper. He wanted to get it into the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. I rewrote it for him. We became friends. And then a medical doctor interested in the history, Ethan Russo, joined up with him. And another big team went in there. They chemically analyzed it. They have more or less confirmed that it's a very strong indication. Not only was it, is it psychoactive, but there were no other things in the materials in this grave that were, there were no fibers and there were no uh, seeds other than the mass in here, the inflorescence, the female, indicating it was probably used for uh, either medicine or for uh, spiritual use. Now, hemp is linked with shamanism because cannabis can be psychoactive, and it's a va an ally, as I've suggested, for spirit quests. And this link now manifested in ritual use by shaman, hemp rope, and cloth bridges to pathways, spirits across modern Asia. So we're going to move quickly through here some examples. Here you see in uh, Korea, uh, wearing hemp, absolutely essential. Confucius who banned or said, we get rid of this weed, it's paganism, and we want to get rid of shamanism, but we need to wear the cannabis, and what you wear depends on how close you were to your deceased father, mother, and how long you'll wear it, how rough it is, a sign of dedication and uh, suffering and uh, ancestor uh, humility, essentially. And we can see this all the way across Asia and to a degree into southeastern uh, Europe, where there was the cult use that Sherrod and others have talked about, that it takes cannabis right up to the edges of, of eastern Europe, but not into western Europe, which was a beer drinking culture and had other perhaps plants of the gods. This is a soup that's eaten, a special soup that has to have hemp seed in it and for festive days. Christianity more or less wiped out the shamanism as it spread across into the eastern part of Europe and into Russia. And this wiped out, I uh, hypothesize, and we hypothesize, like Confucianism, these large-scale monotheistic or large-scale uh, philosophies or religions put down shamanism, and as a result, cannabis then, uh, but what so long for 10,000 years, perhaps in many of these places, certainly for thousands of years as it spread out, become important. So I want to take you beyond the Hmong to, to a little bit here in Korea and Japan and a brief just survey. Uh, in Eastern Europe, burial, covering, all the way to uh, uh, Central Asia, at least covering with hemp uh, in the burial. Uh, this is important. So I'm going to move on. And this is actually a fellow who grew up in Hawaii, became one of the few people over 10,000 years of sumo wrestling to reach Yokozuna, which is the rope, horizontal rope, the connecting, like Shimon uh, Nawa, which is the rope that includes us all in oneness. Uh, another Korean example that comes from China, the word for uh, hemp, dama, dama, goes all the way through Korea to Japan, showing the connection there. Uh, the ties that bind, rituals, and these are, I would argue, are remnants of shamanic jo uh, Joman use and importance of this multi-purpose plan for fishing, uh, medicine, fiber for the ropes and the nets, and for psychoactive purposes, because it would have been the species cannabis indica, which can be made and selected for strictly hemp and low amounts of THC, but has the potential, if you were so inclined, to artificially select it as people do today. Go to Japan and the ropes that connect. Go to Japan and you'll see, take you just quickly on a sumo wrestling 
uh, example of the importance of hemp from China to Korea and into Japan. And so this, uh, in Shinto, very important, the right here we have the Shimanawa, the enclosing rope, symbolizing oneness. And you see this, and it's hemp rope. You talk of these are like some of the largest hemp ropes you'll find. These are actually used all the way up to Scandinavia for winter when you have a lot of snow to put these in the streets called ro rope walks. Now here's another sumo wrestler, he's wearing this special belt. If he re reaches the highest realm in which he has to uh, acknowledge the emperor and the oneness in this special kind of uh, belt. To, to, okay, last thing then. The, according to one legend, it's more important to say that around his waist in 1630 is a sign of respect, some would argue, for the emperor. He had to wear this title. And so just to finish up, Confucius' mandate runs through a variety of different cultures today, including Eastern Europe, to give you just some historic pictures of spinning bees and the special garb that has so much symbolic value and takes us back to the days of Scythia with our final picture from even some Albanian in uh, Serbian, Croatian, Albanian, special days, special garb, all the way through marriage to uh, funerals. So, Southern Europe still had the cannabis and I would argue that this ritualistic hemp and fiber stretches all the way from cent uh, Southeastern Europe across the great European steps to Japan. Thank you very much.